clock on the wall says 7.01, so that means we should get started. Uh, welcome to our talk in preparation for uh, Remembrance Day. Uh, I thought it would be great to have um, our guest speaker, Frank Kramer, come down. Um, but before I introduce Frank, let me point out that we still have books in the library, and uh, this is one of the better ones on the theme of uh, aircraft and war. It's called <coughs> Under an English Heaven. It's a novel, uh, Under an English Heaven by Robert Radcliffe, a friend of myself. It's fabulous. Um, for example, the Sunday Telegraph says, the descriptions of air combat are first class, humor and pathos are blended to superb effect. Radcliffe is not just a born storyteller, but one of those generous writers who look for the best in human nature. So, if you look for a good novel on this topic for tonight, Under an English Heaven by Robert Radcliffe. Um, Frank Kramer um, is known to me indirectly um, through my wife Edith. Edith and Frank were schoolmates in Prince Edward County back in the 50s and 60s. And um, I heard about this gentleman from Edith when uh, I got married. I thought, well, that's a nice to guy. And sure enough, uh, he's got a background in World War II planes. And I met him for the first time last summer. And uh, he sure does have a background in planes because he's been at the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Ancaster for 13 years as a guide. And uh, I think we're lucky to have him with us tonight to talk about Canada's air war and the war birds of World War II. Please welcome Frank Kramer. Thank you very much and uh, good evening everyone. And uh, I'd like to say briefly from the outset, it's really great to be back in London. Uh, I retired earlier this year from the University of Western Ontario campus of Ace. And this is actually the second time I've had the opportunity to be in London. And uh, as Mark said, I now live in a little village called Wellington, Prince Edward County. And uh, near Picton, Ontario. It's a beautiful area. But uh, i got to tell you, I do miss London. It's a beautiful city. And uh, it's really great to be back here this evening to have an opportunity to talk to you all. This evening, um, as Mark mentioned also, I am a volunteer member of the Canadian Northland Heritage Museum for the last 13 years. And I'd like to say uh, at the outset, I am not an author, and I do not claim to be an historian of any great note, but I do do, do tours at the museum, and I'm a little different from some of the other tour guides at the museum. A lot of the tour guides, uh, and they're all great tour guides, when I do tours, besides talking about the aircraft, I also like to tell personal stories related to that aircraft. I find we get a lot of people that come into the museum, and sometimes, you know, wives or girlfriends or People that are not into airplanes, if you're in the museum for an hour to two hours, if you're not into it, it can get uh, a little intense. But I do find if you can tell a personal story related to that airplane, and I've seen it happen numerous times, it makes it all that much more real. So this evening I would like to tell you about our museum, Canadian Warplane Heritage, what it's all about. And also I'd like to talk about some of the aircraft that we do have. Now we have so many aircraft that I will not have time to talk about all of them. But I also have some personal stories I want to tell you, some actually amazing stories about some rather incredible things that these young men did with these airplanes so many, many, many years ago. I'd like to start off by telling you a story related to this airplane right here. This airplane, of course, is the Admiral Lancaster Bomber. And this was the supreme night bomber of World War II. No other Allied bomber in World War II had a greater bomb load capacity than the Admiral Lancaster. First came to service with the Royal Air Force in March of 1942 and remained in service throughout World War II. Now during World War II, there were a total of 19 men that won the Victoria Cross in Bomber Command alone. And of course, the VC was the highest medal awarded by the British Empire for bravery and valor. And of that 19 men that won the Victoria Cross and Bomber Command alone, there were nine who won the VC flying Admiral Lancasters. And of that nine, two Canadians, Ian Baselgett and Andrew Winarski. Now a little later I'm going to come back to the Lancaster because I want to tell Andy's story. In fact, this airplane is dedicated to his memory. But uh, I want to tell you another story about a Victoria Cross winner in, in Bomber Command. And if you ever get the opportunity on the internet, or uh, to check out 
the other winners of BC and Bomber Command. It's a fascinating story. Each man did an absolutely incredible thing. But next to Andy Winarski's story, my favorite is the story of a young Scotchman by the name of Bill Reed. And his story is an amazing story. It's kind of like the, the little engine that could. And this guy did an absolutely tremendous, gutty performance to bring his crew and his ship back home. Bill Reed was 21 years old, and uh, he's about, oh, about this tall, not a very tall man. And he had sort of an angelic face and a wispy little mustache. In fact, he looked more like a bank clerk than a bomber pilot. And on November 3rd, 1943, his squadron, he flew with the RAF, number 61 squadron, flew Lancasters, and his uh, Lank was codenamed Q for Queenie. And on that date, November 3rd, 1943, they had a very important mission to bomb. It was a ball bearing plant in Dusseldorf, Germany. Now, during the war, of course, you had to do 30 missions to complete your tour, especially in 1943. And on this night, this was going to be his 10th mission. They take off from their base, and that night, Bill Reed's squadron had a lot of company. It was a maximum effort. There were close to 500 Lancaster, Halifax, Sterling, and Wellingtons in the air that night to bomb this target. Bill Reed's Lancaster no sooner crosses the enemy coast than a German night fighter pops out of the clouds, Mischer Smith 110. Now normally if a Lancaster was flying like this, what would happen is the night fighters would come from behind, try and get underneath the Lank, rotate the guns up, try and knock out the engines, or fire underneath the wings where the fuel tanks were. Because Lancaster and all British bombers, unlike American B-24, B-17s, they were not armor-plated, so they were quite vulnerable for bloody attacks. Anyway, this night fighter pops out of the clouds and he did a very rare thing a very rare frontal attack. He fires his machine guns into Bill Reed's cockpit. His whole windshield right here is totally blown away. And Bill Reed is cut to pieces by this flying plexiglass. Flying plexiglass tears into his leather helmet. He suffers a major head wound. A part of his cheeks or a face that's not covered by his oxygen mask is cut. It tears into his gloves and part to his jacket. And he starts bleeding profusely. Now, they're flying about 20,000 feet, and of course, a wartime Lancaster, uh, there were no heating system. The only heating system, they had electric suits, which we plugged in to the ship. And they're flying at 20,000 feet, the air is minus 40, minus 50 degrees. And all of a sudden, you have this cold Arctic air spewing through the cockpit. The air is so cold that within minutes, the blood that's flowing from Bill Reed's head, face, and hands begins to freeze to his body. Now he goes on the intercom, checks the rest of the crew, everyone else is okay. He checks his four Merlin engines, they're not hit, so despite his injuries and this cold Arctic air pouring into the cockpit, he proceeds onward to the target. A few minutes later, another night fighter pops out of the clouds. This time, it's an FW Fire Wolf. And this time, this night fighter does absolute havoc to his ship and to his crew. His navigator, who's uh, located directly behind Bill Reed is killed. The uh, radio operator behind him is mortally wounded and he would die before they would make it back. Bill Reed's flight engineer is directly to his right and of course all British uh, bombers in World War II were one pilot airplane. There was no co-pilot like American bombers. They had a flight engineer and of course the flight engineer was basically a mechanic. He would assist the pilots on takeoff and landing and readjusting fuel mixture during flight. But they were not trained pilots. If Bill Reed is killed, they got a bailout because they never taught these guys how to fly an airplane. Bill Reed's flight engineer is wounded and uh, they proceed onward to the target despite a, a lack of uh, a navigator. And I should point out also that Bill Reed's trim tabs of his airplane are shot out, so he can't trim the airplane. It's like flying a bucking bronco now. His Lancaster is sort of flying like this. Despite all this, and the lack of a navigator, Bill Reed still proceeds onward to the target. Now, he was one of the last bombers to drop his bombs on the target and basically follow the rest of the bomber stream to the target. Once he releases his bombs, he pulls off to the, from the target, and as he's pulling off, he gets combed by the German searchlights. Now the Germans on the ground have these gigantic 
arc lights and they're shining these lights up into the heaven. Of course, if they get a light in their lights, they do a coning effect, they turn all the lights on to that airplane, light it up, turn their massive flat guns, which are firing these massive exploding shells, up to Bill Reed's Lancaster. Bill Reed's Lancaster is being raped by flat. Now, he's only got seconds to get out this, of this uh, bright light, and bomber crews will tell you that you've only got seconds to do it because when you get combed by the searchlights, it's, everything goes white, you lose your, your horizon. It's like taking a flashlight and shining it right in your eye. You can't see your thing. The only way possibly to get out of this massive light is by doing a massive turn to the port or starboard side, a corkscrew. And Bill Reed, as hard as he can, cranks his steering wheel to the left. And lucky for him, he's able to corkscrew out of the light into the safety of darkness. And he heads off to the North Sea. As he's crossing the North Sea now, he's lost so much blood, he's falling in and out of unconsciousness. And the flight engineer beside him is yelling at him, shaking him, trying to do anything to keep him awake. All of a sudden, his onboard engines begin to sputter. His inboard engines begin to sputter. He checks his gas gauge, they're down on empty. His engines are being starved, for lack of fuel, he's losing altitude. And within the next couple of minutes, he's going to crash into the North Sea. Now, suddenly, Bill Reed's flight engineer to his right, who was wounded, all of a sudden realizes, holy crap, I've got fuel. He's been so concerned about keeping Bill Reed awake, he forgot to turn the tanks. So he's scrambling to turn on the tanks that actually have fuel. They feed up the lines. The lines are running to his engines, feeding these start and murder engines. Bill Reed's able to fire up his engines before crashing into the North Sea. He pulls up to about 1,000 feet. By now, they're off oxygen. He's on his way home. But because he's flying at 1,000 feet, there's still this cold Arctic air pouring into his cockpit. But at 1,000 feet, it's not quite as cold as 20,000. And slowly, his wounds, especially his head wound, begins to open up once again. He finally makes it to the coast of England. By this time, it's 4.30, 4 to 5 in the morning. Because they've been using the moon and stars as reference points to get back home, Flight engineer does a quick calculation and realizes, Skipper, we haven't got enough gas to make it to our base. They hit the coast of England. He goes on the radio for anyone that will take him in for an emergency landing. Now, there's an American air base, uh, part of the 8th Air Force, they fly B-24 Liberators during the daytime. They hear his distress call, and they radio in to read. They say, come on in, we'll take you. Now, they're a daytime base. They're not equipped for nighttime landing. So what they do, they take their fire trucks, Jeeps out there try and light up the runway. But what they can't light up, they'll pour some gas along the side, kind of chalk out a glorified runway. Bill Reed's Lancaster, Cuford Queenie, comes in. He drops gear, his wheels come down. He's got two greens indicating his wheels are locked. And he's struggling with all his might to line up this Lancaster on the runway. His Lancaster comes in, the wheels no sooner touch the runway than both wheels collapse. He ends up doing a belly landing. He skids 60 yards down the runway, finally comes to a grinding halt. When he does, the crash tenders come out, they hose down his airplane. And once the fire is put out, they enter the Lancaster and go up to the cockpit. When they get up to the cockpit, they see Bill Reed. He's slumped in his chair like this. He's covered in blood. He's not moving. A couple of grounds guys figures, well, this guy's bottom. He's had it. When they undo his belt and haul him up from the seat, he begins to warm in pain. They figure, my God, this guy's still alive. They put him on the stretcher and take him to the hospital. With the amount of blood he's lost, they figure, there's no way this guy's going to make it. But Bill Reed did. He spent over six weeks in the hospital recovering from his wounds. And much later, when he was well enough, they awarded Bill Reed Victoria Cross for bringing his ship and his crew home. Now, when Bill was well enough to receive visitors inside the hospital, his base commander came in to see him. And his base commander said to him, he said, Bill, he said, the first time your Lancaster was hit, when your windshield was blown out, he said, why didn't you turn back? And Bill Reed, who was totally unassuming about Scotch, but not for a second, he said, uh, he said, well, sir, he said, my engines weren't hit. And uh, to be honest with you, sir, he said, uh, thought never occurred to me to turn back. <laughs> but that was his 10th mission. 
He still had 20 more missions to do to complete his tour. And what happened was, several months later, he's flying over Germany one night. And what happened, this happened quite often in a mission sometimes, another Lancaster was flying above him. And Bill Reed had released his bombs, and the lank above him didn't get his timing right, and he released his bombs on top of Bill Reed's. The bombs went down, broke Bill Reed's wing off his Lancaster, as Lancaster began spiraling down to the ground. Now, in a wartime Lancaster, the escape hatch for the pilot, the top of this plexiglass right here would open up. Bill Reed popped open the top, undoes his belts, but because the lank is spinning down, he's pulling out a G force, which is forcing him into the seat. It takes all of his strength to pull himself out of the cockpit. Once he gets out, he pulls the ripcord, his chute fully deploys, and within seconds, he hits the ground. He suffered spinal uh, injuries, and he was picked up by the Germans and spent the rest of the war in a POW camp. But he was released at the end of World War II. Now, Bill Reed, like a lot of veterans during World War II, was very low key about what he did. At the end of World War II, when he went back to private life, in fact, he went back to school. He got a degree in agriculture from the University of Edinburgh, and he worked in several countries as a, an advisor, and actually he worked here in Canada in the late 40s. Eventually, he uh, went back to Scotland and uh, worked for the government, and he retired in 1981. Now, Bill Reed, he got married in 1953, and you know his wife found out at a considerable later date that he won the Victoria Cross. He never talked about what he did. He lived in a small village in Scotland, and in November 2001, he passed away at the age of uh, 79. And when he passed away, it was front page news in all the papers in Scotland. And even people in his own village, when they saw this, they figured, he did what? They absolutely had no idea. But back on November 3rd, 1943, this little man, Bill Reed, did a superhuman effort to bring his ship and his crew home. Bill Reed was, again, one of the 19 winners to win the Victoria Cross the Bomber Command and one of the nine to win the BC flying that airplane right there, the Admiral Lancaster. <coughs> you must bear with me, just getting over a head cold. <coughs> the more I talk, the more I tighten up here. Frank, I just ask, do you have Lancaster's as your museum in Hamilton? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I meant to point out that, that Lancaster, that is our Lancaster. Yeah. 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 In fact, uh, I'll be coming back to the Lancaster. At that time, I'm going to give you a little bit more history of the, of the, of the Lancaster. Um, so as I said, I, I'm a member of the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum. This is our museum right here. It's, it's not a very good shot. It's an overhead shot. Uh, our museum, we're located right by the John Monroe Hamilton International Airport. And in fact, this year is the 40th anniversary of our museum. We uh, actually this year had a massive air show back on Father's Day weekend. It's kind of a return to the old uh, big Hamilton International Air Show. In fact, uh, they rated our air show fifth best air show in North America this year, which is kind of nice. And um, what you see here really began well over 40 years ago. Uh, what happened was back around 1970, there were four businessmen from the Hamilton, Toronto, and Niagara area, and they would come up to uh, Mount Hope, where uh, the airport is, on weekends to do some recreational flying. Now, these men were uh, very successful businessmen, and they had their own pilot's license. And these men got talking to one another, and they said, uh, hey, you know, wouldn't it be kind of neat to fly a World War II aircraft, something like a Spitfire or a Hawker Hurricane or a Mustang? Well, they got talking to one another and they figured, well, yeah. And they decided to pull their resources together. And the first airplane that they acquired was this airplane right here. And this airplane here is called a Ferry Firefly. It was a British naval aircraft. Uh, first flew with the Royal Naval, uh, uh, with the Navy, Fleet Armed Service in 1941. And after World War II, our Navy bought these fireflies from Britain. And they flew with our Navy from 1946 until 1953 for anti-sub patrol. Of course, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, our Navy did possess an aircraft carrier. Uh, from 1946 to 1949, it was the Warrior. And from 49 to 57, the Magnificent. And then from 57 to 69, the Bonaventure. 
And this uh, Firefly right here is not the original uh, Firefly that we acquired, but it is our current airplane that we have. And, uh, you know, next to Lancaster, this personally is my favorite airplane. Uh, it's powered by a Rolls Griffin engine. And if you've ever heard of a Griffin engine, I often describe a Griffin engine, it sounds like a Spitfire with a bad head cold. It is a loud engine. How loud? Well, I've seen it happen. You can actually take our Lancaster, and uh, the four Merlin engines in the Lancaster is extremely loud when you fire them up. And you can take that Firefly, park it, <coughs> it, rev it up, and it will drown out the Lancaster. That's how loud that engine is. But this was the first airplane that uh, these four gentlemen acquired. And uh, it soon followed, they started uh, purchasing some other aircraft. And it also occurred to these four men at the time that around 1970-71, uh, in Canada, although we did have air museums, there was no place in Canada that you could actually see these airplanes fly. Uh, there was no place where you could see a Spitfire, a Mustang, let alone a Lancaster fly. So this thought, along with the acquisitions of these aircraft, sort of planted the seeds of what would officially become, in 1972, a flying museum called the Canadian Warplane Heritage. Now, essentially, the purpose of our museum is to obtain, restore, and fly aircraft flown by Canadians from World War II up until the present date. Now, currently, we have 47 aircraft in our collection. And of that collection, some very rare airplanes. Of course, only one of two airworthy Avro Lancasters left in the entire world. The other one's over in England with the RAF Memorial Flight. In fact, the Firefly we see right here. You know, in the world today, there are only two airworthy examples of that aircraft left. In fact, technically, really only one. The other Firefly is, uh, there's one down in the United States at an air museum in San Diego. And what happened was back in June of this year, uh, their Firefly was coming in for a landing, and the landing gear collapsed. Ended up doing a belly landing, did major damage to the undercarriage and to the engine. Fortunately, the pilot wasn't hurt. But the airplane, it can be repaired, but it's going to be, it won't be flying for a good year, maybe two years. So currently in the world today, this is the only flying example of a fairy firefly left in the entire world today. You know, when I speak to younger people at the museum, I often describe <coughs> these warbirds from World War II. All of them are like dinosaurs in a way, because some, you know, there are just no flying examples left, for example. This airplane you're looking at right here is a Hemi Page Halifax bomber. And this was the other big Hemi that the British flew during World War II, the Halifax and Lancasters. Now, of the two, the Lancaster, of course, had a greater bomb load capacity. And Bomber Harris, who was in charge of uh, Bomber Command, initially he uh, was very much a fan of the Halifax, but after the Lang came into service, and the early Lancaster, the early Halifax had problems with their engines. And um, they, uh, as the war went on, he became more of a Lancaster fan and not that great of a, of a Halifax fan. But the interesting thing is more Canadian bomber crews in World War II flew Halifax than Lancasters. And you know, in the world today, the last year where the Halifax was scrapped over in England back in 1961, there are none flying today. In fact, in the world today, there are only two standing examples of a heavy page Halifax left. There's one in England, and the one over in England is kind of a hybrid because the part of the tail assembly is from a Avro New York, so it's not a really a true Halifax. The other one is right here in Canada. If you ever get a chance to go down to Trenton Air Base, they have a beautiful Halifax that uh, they restored. It took them 13 years to re rebuild it. Some of you may know the story. It was a uh, French <coughs> Halifax, and it uh, did a crash landing in a Norwegian fjord, and it sank down to about 700 feet of fresh water and remain there up until 1995. At that time, the Halifax Society, along with a grant from the government, actually they went and they located the airplane and with airbags they were able to bring the airplane up pretty well intact to the surface. It was dismantled, flown to Trenton, and then painstakingly for the next 13 years it was restored to static condition. It will never fly. But to see that airplane today, honest to God, I live down that area and I see the Halifax quite often. It looks like it just came out of the assembly line. It's just a beautiful job on that airplane. You know, the interesting thing when they brought that airplane up, 
They actually found a couple of thermoses full of coffee. Coffee's still in it. They actually found compasses, despite years being that depth of water. When they brought them up, they still worked perfectly. But uh, as I said, um, this airplane, like a lot of warbirds from World War II, some of them there are just no airworthy examples left flying today. Now here at uh, our museum, we are <coughs> in the process of restoring three aircraft. And uh, our first restoration, this is our major restoration right here. This airplane you see right up here is called a Bristol Bowling Book. Now, the British would call that a Blenheim. And the Blenheim Bowling Books were a twin-engine light bomber. It had a bomb load capacity of roughly 2,000 pounds. And um, in the late 30s, 1938, 39, 40, uh, we had license to build this airplane here in Canada. We were built by the Fairchild Company in uh, Quebec. And we built a little over 600 of these airplanes. And when World War II broke out, we had squadrons of bullies both on the east and west coast of Canada to protect our coastline. In fact, the first Japanese submarine that was ever sunk by an aircraft of the Royal Canadian Air Force was sunk by the Bristol Bowling Book. Now, by late 1942 into 43, these airplanes were withdrawn from coastal command. By 43, we start getting the B-24 Liberators from the States and PPYs, and uh, these airplanes were withdrawn, and the vast majority of them went to Western Canada, and they used the airplanes, <coughs> excuse me, as trainers for uh, bombardiers and also target tugs. By the end of World War II, this airplane was declared surplus and were simply chopped up, scrapped, with no thought of preserving them. Now down here, this is our holy right here that we're restoring, and this has been a major restoration project. They've been working on that airplane, believe it or not, for the last 20 years. Um, it only took us 11 years to rebuild the Lancaster, but the thing is, restoring a warbird, there's always three factors in restoring an aircraft. Dollars and cents, availability of parts, and of course the people to put them together. The big thing with this airplane here has been the availability of parts. What you see here is not an original airframe. There are parts from eight different molding books to make up that airframe. In fact, essentially that airplane was created from scratch. But uh, they're making great headway. They may not look it, but believe me, they are doing making a great headway on the airplane. The Bolingbroke crew are, I swear to God, they are the eternal optimists. Uh, they have been saying every year, you know, another two or three years, but they're really now uh, saying that for two or three years this airplane will be finished. Uh, the intent is to make this airplane fly. And, you know, in the world today, there are no flying examples of the Bolingbroke Blenheim left in the entire world. And we hope within the next two or three years to have an actual airworthy Bowling book, blending. And when it's finished, it will be painted in the colors of 119 Squadron, which was the city of Hamilton Tiger Squadron. And that squadron flew out of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia between 1939 and 1942 as a German U boat sub hunter. Yes, I'm just I'm curious. Um, where does the funding come from to, to restore these planes? Well, that's, that's a good question. In our museum, we receive little, if any, federal or provincial funding. How it's all done, it's done through uh, actually good people like yourselves coming to the museum, paying admission. Uh, during air shows, we make money you know, with the lake and our airplanes go to air shows. Uh, we have an education program. In fact, I'm uh, going to the museum tomorrow. Monday through Friday, we have an excellent uh, program for grade sixers. It's called the Theory of Flight. And we also have the history program for grade tens. And when they come, they're pretty well there for about half the day at the museum. Uh, we also do, believe it or not, wedding receptions um, at the museum. In fact, usually it's kind of cool because, uh, in fact, if I was getting married, that's where I'd have my reception. Uh, because usually at the head table, usually the lank is right behind the head table. You can't get a better backdrop than that. And uh, so we do wedding receptions, different functions, and that's uh, basically how we uh, keep things going. Plus, people uh, can pay to fly for these airplanes. Uh, People can pay to fly in the Lancaster. It's the most expensive. Um, to fly, there's four seats inside our Lancaster, and to uh, fly in that airplane for an hour flight, it's uh, what is it, $2,500. It's a lot of money, but you know, in the world today, uh, there are only two, and the one over in England is part of the Royal Air Force Memorial Flight, so the general public cannot fly in that airplane. So ours is the only one that. Uh, that Insurance. 
Sorry, I'm such a practical. Like I can know you're, I understand your funding, but how do you ensure this place, or how do you? Um, you know what? As, as far as when it comes to insurance, you know, I'll be the first to admit I don't know all the incidents about okay. that. Yeah, yeah. But it's just, um, it's an expensive. But for example, as I said, twenty-five hundred dollars to fly in one hour uh, in that airplane. We have people booked years, uh, like a year ahead. A lot of people come over from England. In fact, we have one gentleman. Uh, this summer was his eighth trip, and he comes over every year for his Lancaster flight. Is he a former pilot? Like I have no idea. I don't know. All I know is, God, I have a lot of money. <laughs> good, and good. yeah, he comes over every year, and, that, and that's fine because. Um, Part of the reason why it's so expensive in that airplane is that um, the crew will tell you for one hour of flight it costs the museum roughly four thousand dollars an hour because each Merlin engine, uh, you know, it's one thousand six hundred ninety horsepower a piece, and they suck up gas like a drunken sailor on a Saturday night. <laughs> they were never designed for fuel economy. So, but the neat thing is, people, um, you know, they'll get their ride, and you actually, when you pay for something uh, for a ride, you actually get a tax receipt. For that, because it's considered a charitable donation, yeah. so it, can, it kind of works both ways. Yeah. And again, it helps uh, keep them flying. Thanks. Uh, this is another airplane that we're restoring right here. This is a TBM Avenger, and the Avenger was built by Grumman. They were American designed and built aircraft, naval aircraft. And uh, these airplanes uh, first cut their teeth with the U.S. Navy during the Battle of Medway in June of 1942, and. Uh, Pilots that flew them, you know, love to fly them. They're a very sturdy airplane, great torpedo bomber. In 1950, the Royal Canadian Navy bought 35 of these airplanes from the U.S., and later they would follow up by another 60. And this airplane right here, the TBM Avengers, once started to replace the Fairy Firefly. Uh, in fact, by 1953, uh, rather, the Fireflies were you know, struck off duty, and the Avengers were used as a carrier-based anti-sub patrol aircraft. Now, this right here is our Avenger. Now, I tried to find a more recent photograph because, believe me, there's a lot more work that's been done on this airplane. This was taken probably, hmm, I'd say, very early this spring. Every time I go to the museum, I see more work being done on this airplane. And uh, they, uh, when this airplane is finished, and they say it'll be about a year, maybe two years at the most, when it's finished, it will look like it will be in this color scheme. The only difference was it will be numbered 324 and it will represent a Royal Canadian Navy Avenger that flew off the deck of the Maggie around 1953 with 881 squadron. And uh, the, the other thing about the Avenger, too, I should point out, is that these airplanes, when they were retired from our Navy in July of 1960, a lot of them took on a, a totally brand new life. I'm originally from northern New Brunswick and uh, the Brunswick Lands and Forest bought a whole ton of these Avengers, and they used them in the 50s, or the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, up until quite recently, as fire bombers and bug sprayers. In fact, the last fire bomber was retired earlier this summer, and uh, I can remember going down as a child down to uh, my hometown of Bathurst, New Brunswick, and seeing them fly out of Bathurst and chat New Brunswick. And uh, so, you know, just just a great airplane and uh, very versatile aircraft too. But as I said, that airplane's about two years away from completion. The other restoration we're doing right here, this twin-engine airplane is called the Grumman Tracker. And starting in 1957, this is the airplane that started replacing the Avenger as far as a carrier-based anti-sub patrol aircraft. <coughs> These airplanes initially were designed and built in the United States, but in 1957, the Hamlin of Canada had license to build them for our Navy. And this one was built in 1959. It actually flew off the deck of the Maggie, or I'm sorry, the uh, Bonaventure in the uh, late 50s. And uh, these airplanes had long service with our Navy Armed Forces. The last of them were phased out in 1990. Uh, this was taken about a year ago and before it got a sponsor. And now we're in the process of rebuilding, re restoring the airplane. They've stripped it all down. We've got two brand new white cycle engines that are going to be putting it into this airplane. And this airplane is about two years away from completion. And I'm really quite excited about this because when this is finished, we will have at our museum the only airworthy example of Royal Canadian Navy carrier-based anti-sub patrol with Firefly, Avenger, and Tracker in the air. It's going to be really kind of cool once it gets done. Um, 